Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, we're going to be moving on. Uh, we're busy going through exam paper questions. And if you recall from yesterday, I said to you we were going to be going through um, exam paper questions of the work that we've done so far. So I've got quite a few exam paper questions of the work we've done so far. I'm hoping to finish them today and then we can start tomorrow to do new revision of new work. I mean, as in work I haven't done with you yet, like the Doppler effect and things like that and the photoelectric effect. Okay, learners investigate some of the factors that influence the rate of a chemical reaction. Okay, so this is obviously rates of reaction. It says in the experiment, they add equal amounts of each of three different metals separately to equal volumes of excess dilute hydrochloric acid. Okay, so that's important. We've got three different metals separately to three different equal amounts of three different metals separately to equal volumes of excess dilute hydrochloric acid solution. In each experiment, the acid completely covers the metal. The data obtained is recorded as in the table below. So here we've got the experiments, one, two, and three. Here is the amount of metal powder, and you can see we've got 0.1 moles of zinc, 0.1 moles of magnesium, and 0.1 moles of copper. So what's important here is they've actually added the same amount of moles. So when they said equal amounts, it's not grams, it's moles, which is great, it's awesome, okay? Then they say change in temperature of the solution, and this is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So this is the temperature of the solution, and the difference was plus 23. This is plus 37, and copper, there's no change in temperature. The time taken for the reaction to run to completion was 25.2. Mm, it doesn't say if it's minutes or seconds. Ah, oh, must be seconds. Okay, that's actually bad. They should have had like a little S here. This is 8.3 seconds, I'm assuming. Oh, it's a different graph. Okay, so it doesn't say if this is in minutes or seconds. So we can assume it's seconds. And yeah, there is no reaction. Okay, now it says, is the reaction experiment one endothermic or exothermic? Give a reason for answer, use the information in the table. So do you agree that the solution, the temperature of the solution has increased from, it's gone T final minus T initial is plus 23. So the temperature of the solution has increased, okay? So therefore, what would it be? Would it be an endothermic or exothermic reaction? The answer is that it's an exothermic reaction because it is giving off heat. It's giving off heat, okay? The final temperature of the solution was way hotter than the initial temperature, so therefore it is exothermic because it is given off heat. Now it says which factor influencing the reaction rate is investigated? Okay, so let's have a look at this. We've got excess dilute hydrochloric acid, so it's not that. The quantity of the metal powder is the same. So I would say that what we're looking at is the type of metal. So we're looking at whether zinc, magnesium, or copper are going to react with dilute um, hydrochloric acid. Um, yeah, because the next thing that they're measuring is temperature and time they've measured, okay? So they've measured the temperature, they've measured the time, so I would say the thing that they're measuring is the type of metal, because there are three different metals. Then it says, how will the total volume of hydrogen gas produced in experiment two compare with the total volume of hydrogen gas produced in experiment one at the end of the reactions? Write down higher than, equal to, or smaller than. Okay, so this is a pretty cool thing because do you agree you've got one mole of zinc and one mole of magnesium? And you're reacting it with the hydrochloric acid, okay? If you have a metal and an acid, you're going to end up with salt and hydrogen, okay? Metal plus an acid, you end up with a salt plus hydrogen. Okay, now we've got excess of this. We've got tons of the acid, okay? The metal, we've got the same amount. We've got 0.1 moles, 
okay? So do you agree that the amount of hydrogen gas at the end of the completion is going to be the same amount? It's going to be the same amount, okay? It's equal to. And the reason for that is because the thing that's producing the hydrogen is actually the acid. And you've got excess acid. You are not going to run out of acid. So therefore, the amount, and you've got the same amount, the same amount of metal. So therefore, the same amount of hydrogen gas is going to be produced. Nice question that I like that question. Okay, let us now look at question 5.4, which is on the right hand side here. It says the graphs obtained by experiment 1 and experiment 2, labels as 1 and 2 respectively, are sketched in the same set of axes as shown. Ha! So even if you didn't know this, do you see they've got your volume of hydrogen gas and experiment 1 and experiment 2? And do you see that the volume remains the same? So therefore, even if you didn't know why, you could have written equal to and you would have got at least one mark. Okay, so feel free to use that information that they give you. Okay, but the correct answer is equal to and why? Because of the excess hydrochloric acid which is producing in both. Okay, now it says, so now we've got the volume of hydrogen gas produced and the time. And we can see experiment one takes a little bit longer to reach completion than experiment two. And it says, in which experiment does the reaction occur at a higher rate at time T1? Okay. At T1, we're looking at the slope. The rate of the reaction is looking at the slope. Okay, so if we look at this, do you see that this graph has got a slope that looks like this, whereas T2 slope looks more like that? Okay, well, hang on, let me just see if it does. Um, here it is. Let me do it again. We're going up from T1. Okay, so T1 slope is like that, and T, I mean T2 slope is like that, and T1 slope is like that. So although it's pretty small, I would say that T1 has got the faster rate of reaction at T1. Okay, that experiment one has got a faster rate of reaction at T1 than T2. And why is that? That's because T2's, I mean, the, the experiment two is actually ending off already. At T1, this experiment is running to completion already, okay? Whereas experiment one, it's still going. So it says, explain the answer to question 5.4.1, referring to the relative strength of reducing agents involved. Okay. So, what we can say is that the reducing agent in T2 is obviously much stronger, in experiment 2 is obviously much stronger than the reducing agent in experiment 1 because the rate of the reaction, I mean, sorry, let's try again. The re relative strength of the reducing agents. The reducing agent in experiment one is obviously much stronger than the reducing age. No, even though this is slower at this point, we know that the experiment two runs to completion faster. Okay, that is why the rate at T1 is sl slower because it's already running to completion. Therefore, the um, reducing agent in experiment two is stronger than the one in experiment one. Okay. It says, in another experiment, experiment four, the same re reaction conditions are repeated as in experiment two. Okay, but, but, what happens is the reaction mixture is heated. The rate of the reaction is higher for experiment four than experiment two. It's explain why the reaction rate is higher for experiment four than for two by referring to the collision theory. Okay, so what you need to say, which is very important, is that 
as we increase the temperature, we increase the average kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of the particles, which means, and this is the very important part, there are more effective collisions per unit time. In fact, I'm not going to write, write up properly, per unit time, therefore the rate of reaction will increase. And this is important, the more effective collisions per unit time. So increasing the temperature increases the average kinetic energy of the particles, which means that there are more effective collisions per unit time, and therefore it increases the reaction rate. Okay, very important that you say that increasing temperature increases the average kinetic energy, and it's very important for you to say that an increase in the kinetic energy increases the effective collisions per unit time. Okay, if you leave out the per unit time, you're going to get it wrong. And if you leave out the word effective, you're going to get it wrong. Okay, right, now let's look at another question. The next question says, the, action, the reaction represented by an equation below reaches equilibrium in a closed container. So you've got nitrogen plus hydrogen gives you ammonia and delta H equals minus 92 kilojoules. So what is this? This is obviously exothermic, exothermic because it's negative, right? We know it's exothermic. It says, is the above equilibrium homogeneous or heterogeneous? Okay, so homogeneous means that it's all in the same phase and heterogeneous is different phases. And when I'm fa talking phases, I'm talking solid, liquid or gas. I know that you guys know about plasma that's out there, but we don't use it yet. So this is in different phases. And if we look at this, this is nitrogen, which is a gas, hydrogen, which is a gas, and ammonia, which is a gas. So therefore we can say it is homogeneous. Okay, now it says changes are made to temperature, pressure, and concentration above equi equilibrium mixture. So at this point here, yeah, nitrogen, hydrogen, ammonia, we're in dynamic equilibrium, okay? The most important thing when you're working with graphs, and it sounds ridiculous, but the most important thing is to read the y-axis because your y-axis tells you what you're looking at. And this could be concentration, or it could be moles, or it could be rate of reaction, okay? Or something similar, but you need to read this because it gives you an idea of what we're working at because if it's moles and then they ask you to work out concentration, you can't just read it straight off the graph unless the volume is one, okay? So you need to always look to see what your y-axis is. 90% of the time, 99% of the time, your x-axis is time, so you don't have to worry about that, but you need to check out your y-axis. Okay, so now what is happening? This is the concentration in moles per decimeter cubed of the ammonia, the hydrogen, and the nitrogen. So let's just write this reaction out again. We've got N2 plus 3H2 is in dynamic equilibrium with ammonia, okay? So the N2 and the H2, these two dudes are your reactants. They're on the same side. So I'm actually going to put them in the same color. This dude here, okay, we'll still put them in different dots and things. And this guy here, on the same side of the equilibrium. Okay. Right. So the in dynamic equilibrium. Okay. Now it says what happened? What changes are made at T1? So what did we do at T1? So if we look at T1, do you agree that N2 went up? The H2 went down. And then eventually the NH3 went up as well. So what I would say it happened at T1 is that we added some N2, okay? We increased the concentration of N2. We added in some N2 to the container. What happened then was we used up, by doing that, by the Shatya's principle, we favored the forward reaction. So then what happens? We, by favoring the forward reaction, we then 
use up some of the hydrogen that's why this has happened and we make more ammonia which is why that happened okay until we reach a new dynamic equilibrium so yeah we've reached a new dynamic equilibrium okay so that's t1 let's have a look at what happened at t2 so t2 we've got a sharp downward spike of both the nitrogen and the hydrogen okay and then it goes up okay whereas the ammonia goes down so the concentration i mean where is ammonia goes sorry the ammonia goes down yeah so do you see the concentration had a spike down a super fast spike down okay so what do you think happened and then what was favored do you agree that the reverse reaction was favored we favored the reverse reaction okay so i would say that what happened here is that at this point our pressure would have changed i would say we had a serious decrease in pressure a sharp decrease in pressure by decreasing the pressure we decrease the concentration right because there's a spike there's a spike and there's a spike so we suddenly decrease the concentration so by decreasing the pressure what are we doing we're favoring the reverse reaction because he has four moles and that's two moles so if we decrease the the pressure what are we doing we are increasing the volume so therefore we are favoring the reverse reaction and we are making more of the reactants and we are using up our products to do that using Balashati's principle so yeah there was a decrease in pressure and what did we say yeah was an increase in the concentration of the N2 now it says how does the rate of the forward reaction compare to the rate of the reverse reaction between naught and t1 they are the same at n2 between 0 and t1 we have reached dynamic equilibrium so therefore the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction so when you see these concentrations here remaining stationary it doesn't mean that the reaction has come to a halt what it means is that the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction so the quantity the concentration remains constant in both the reactants and the products right now let's look at another question it says equal number of moles of hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas are injected into a sealed one decimeter cube container okay. so we've got a sealed one decimeter cubed container okay it says we've added equal number of moles of nitrogen and hydrogen okay the reaction reaches equilibrium at a temperature T1. It is found that 10% of the original amount of hydrogen is left. Okay. So do you agree we're taking some hydrogen and we're adding nitrogen and we're forming, we must be forming ammonia. Okay. So we're going to multiply this by two and that by three. So there is our balanced reaction. It says, we put in equal moles of hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas. When we reach equilibrium, we have 10 at T1, 10% of the original hydrogen is left. So we've got 10% left. Okay. And they tell us that the Kc value is 1,426 times by 10 to the 3. And they want to know what is the initial mass of nitrogen. Okay, so now we need to make a table. So let me just erase this and this, and let's just find some space to draw. So, okay, so we've got N2 plus H2 is in dynamic equilibrium with NH3, and this would have to be a two and that's a three. 
Okay, so what do we have? Start, used, made, equilibrium, and concentration. Okay, so that is my little table. Start, used, made, equilibrium, and concentration. They tell us that our KC is 1.426 times by 10 to the 3. We know that KC is the concentration of the ammonia squared over the concentration of N2 over the concentration of H2 cubed. Okay, the volume is one, so we don't have to worry. So this is the same as that, which is quite nice. They tell us we started with equal amounts of hydrogen and it says we started with equal number of moles of hydrogen gas. Okay, when the reaction reaches equilibrium, we've got 10% of the original is left. Okay, we've got 10% of the original. So how do we do that? We've got 10 out of the 100 of X. Okay, so what is that? That is 0,1 X. That's what we've got left. We've got left at equilibrium 0.1 X, 10% of X. Or you could, yeah. 0.1 of x. Okay, do you are you happy with that? Right. So now, therefore, obviously we didn't make anything out. This is made, not made. Okay, we use stuff. And yeah, we didn't use anything. We're assuming we had zero of that because they told us that we got nine equal number of moles in that. So right now, no, we need to work this out. If we have ten percent of it left, do you agree that we used up? 0,9x. Okay, we used up 0,9x to be left with 0.1x, 10% of it, right? So therefore, we now need to work on the ratio. So the ratio is one mole to three moles. So if I've used up 0.9x of hydrogen, I have to have used up a third of that for nitrogen. So therefore, I have used up 0,3x. Okay, happy with that? 0,3x. Okay, so what are we left with? We're left with 0,7x. Okay, let me show you what I'm doing here. We started with x, we're subtracting 0,3x, and what are we left with? That's the same as 1 x minus 0.3 x which is 0.7 x so that's what we've got at equilibrium is 0.7 x of the nitrogen now the ratio here is 1 to 2 so if i've used 0.3 x i must have made double that so that's 0.6 x and that's what i'm going to have at equilibrium which is 0.6 x okay so now i can shove this in my KC. So let me just erase this. And we need to solve for X. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. Um, okay, so we've got in H3 cubed is squared, so it's 0.6X all over N2 is 0.7X. Sorry, this is all squared multiplied by 0,1x cubed is equal to 1.42 times by 10, 6 times by 10 to the 3. Okay, so do you agree this is going to be, let's do it in the calculator. We've got 0.6, oh, let's clear that, shall we? 0.6 squared which is 0.36. So this is 0.36x squared all over 0.49x all over 0.1 squared is 0.01. 0.01x cubed. So therefore this squared cancels with one of the one of these and one of these to leave you with x squared. So you're left with, oh, and I need to erase this. I'll see if I can write it, make it smaller. So we're left with 0,36 over 0.49 
times by 0.01x squared is equal to 1.426 times by 10 to the 3. Okay, so let's put this in our calculator. So we've got 0.36 divided by bracket 0.49 multiplied by 0.01 close bracket equals 73.47, okay? So we're saying 73.47 over x squared is equal to 1 comma 4 2 6 times by 10 to the 3. So now we can swap these two and we can say I'm running out of space. I'm going to write at the top here. Seventy three comma four seven divided by one comma four two six times by ten to the three is equal to x squared. All I've done is I've cross multiplied. This is over one, so I'm taking that across. I've just done that. All I've done is taken the x squared across and put the number across. So let's pop that into our calculator. Okay, sorry about the sound effects. So you got seventy three point four seven. Mm, Four seven divided by one point four two six exponent exponent three equals that answer there. But now remember that's x squared. So what do we have to do? We have to square root our answer, and we equal to naught point two seven naught comma two seven moles. So that's x x equals naught comma two seven moles. But now they didn't ask the number of moles, did they? What did they ask for? They asked for the mass. So we haven't finished. And so what we need to do is we need to remember 0.27 and erase all ink. So the number of moles is 0.27. But we know that number of moles is mass over molar mass. Therefore, number of moles multiplied by molar mass is equal to mass. So it's 0, 0.27 multiplied by the molar mass, and the molar mass is 14, but it's a diatomic molecule, so it makes it 28. So it's 28 equals m. So therefore, let's get out our calculator again, and we got, why did I say 27? It's 23. Sorry. So we're going to go 0, 0.23 multiplied by 28 is equal to 6,44. So the original mass of nitrogen in the container was 6,44 grams. Whew. Quite a nice sum. Hey, it's quite, quite complicated. Okay. Now it says, Use your knowledge of the Chattis principle to explain how the increase in temperature will affect the Kc. Okay. Now, what you need to understand is that the only thing that affects Kc is temperature. And what you need to understand as well is that if we increase our temperature, we are doing two things. We are increasing our reaction rate but we're also so we're increasing the rate of both the forward reaction and the reverse reaction right but also what we are doing is we are increasing we are favoring the the direction of the endothermic reaction so the even though both reactions are being favored we are changing the direction of the endothermic reaction we're favoring the endothermic reaction more and for that reason kc is going to be changed because you're doing two things one you're increasing the reaction rate overall but two you're increasing the endothermic reaction rate more than the exothermic reaction rate and that is why by the shatis principle you affect your kc Right, now it says, learners perform a titration to standardize a dilute sodium hydroxide. Okay, solution. Okay, we use standard oxalic 
acid, um, sorry, oxalic acid solution, H2C2O4 with water, solution of concentration 0.02 mls per decimeter cubed, titration is repeated three times, which it should be done at least three times to get an average reading, okay, and they show you the values, okay, so you've got titrations, one, two, and three. Then you've got the volume of the oxalic acid, and what have you just seen? You have seen that the volume of the oxalic acid remains constant. Okay, so if the volume of the oxalic acid remains constant, what do we, what can we see? We can see that it must be one of the control variables. Now it says we want the volume of sodium hydroxide. Okay, they've given us the volume of the sodium hydroxide, it changes. Initially, we used 20.24 cubic centimeters to reach the endpoint. Then we got 19.8. Then we got 19.87. And then they averaged it at 19.97. So let's talk about this, okay? It says, what does the term standard solution mean? Well, standard solution, what you need to understand is the titration is this. What we do is we titrate, um, we titrate solutions against each other, okay? So we've got a standard solution of sodium hydroxide and we have, I mean, Sorry, we perform a titration to standardize. Okay, we want to know what the concentration of the sodium hydroxide is. We're going to use a standard oxalic acid. So standard solution is one of known concentration. What we are doing is we are titrating a solution of unknown concentration with one of known concentration. Okay, then because in order to do that, so that we could find, so, so that we can find the the concentration of the unknown. Okay, so that is what a standard solution is. It's one of known concentration. Now it says give a reason why titration is repeated three times. Okay, so you need to understand that titrations we use indicators, and indicators include a change in color. So the problem with that is that it is a qualitative measure instead of a quantitative measure. A qualitative measure is one where you change, look at the change in color um, versus looking at a number, a specific number. Quantitative is looking at a specific number. So what it means is that there's a bit of bias, okay? In other words, you need to be, it's quite it's a little bit easier to be a little bit inaccurate when you're making doing qualitative measures than when you're doing quantitative measures. So for that reason, okay, you need to do this titration at least three times, okay, so that you can get an average. So say for example, I mean I've done the titrations before and when you do them at university they do it for a minimum of five times. The first one you do you just let it run so that you can get a more or less idea of when the, the indicator changes color, okay? So you could let it run and you see, oh, it's about between 20 and 30. Okay, so then you know that somewhere between 20 and 30, or in this case, it would be between 15 and 25. So I would know that somewhere between 15 and 25 cubic centimeters, I have a volume of sodium hydroxide added I have an indicated color change. Then I would do it more accurately to try and establish exactly what that temperature change, what the color change is. And if you have one reading that's very far out, like for example, in this case, let's say you had a reading which was 25.63 or something silly, then do you agree that you would think, well, hmm, if all my other readings are around about 19 and 20 or close to 20, then obviously my 25 might be an incorrect reading, which means you would do another one to try and see if you're right, okay? So the whole point of the correct answer for giving why the titration is repeated three times is because of the fact that you want to make sure that you get an accurate reading. 
Okay, that's all it really is to find an average reading to make sure you get an accurate reading. But I'm basically just explaining what we've been doing. Now it says the balanced equation of the reaction taking place is H2C2O4, and then you see that there's two moles of water crystallization onto that oxalic acid. So you've got H2C2O4, 2H2O, plus your sodium hydroxide goes to Na2C2O4 plus water. And it says, calculate the number of moles of oxalic acid reacting. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to rewrite this formula so that I can fill in stuff. So let's just have a look. So I'm gonna write it over here because that's my most biggest space. I've got H2C2O4 multiplied by two H2O plus two sodium hydroxides goes to Na, hmm, sorry, let me just fix that. I hate it when it spikes like that. It's a different color, but it's fine. Goes to Na2, NaOH plus, no, it doesn't. I'm sorry, I'm misreading. Um, it goes to, and a second, goes to Na2, C2O4 plus 4H2O. And what are they asking? They want to know how many moles of oxalic acid reacting. So they want to know what are the number of moles of this. So what is this equation telling us? It's telling us that theoretically, we've got one mole of this standard oxalic acid solution react to two moles of sodium hydroxide to give you one mole of Na2C2O4 plus four moles of water. That's what it's saying theoretically. Now let's see what they gave us. They said they used standard oxalic acid of concentration 0.02. So we've got a concentration of 0.02. Okay. We've got that we've volume of oxalic acid was given. The volume is given as 25 cubic centimeters. The volume of sodium hydroxide was averaged at 19,97, which we use. And they want to know the number of moles of oxalic acid. So we know that concentration equals number of moles over volume. We have the concentration. The concentration is 0,02 got the concentration. We've got the volume. It's 25. So do you agree that we can find the number of moles? So we can say N is equal to CV. C is the concentration which they gave us at 0, 0, 2 moles per decimeter cubed. Note that this concentration is per decimeter cubed. And what's wrong with this volume? The volume is in cubic centimeters. So how do we convert cubic centimeters to decimeters cubed? What do we need to do? We need to divide by a thousand. So what does that become? It becomes 25. You can just do it like this. You can go 25 divided by 1000 to make it easier for yourself. Okay, so what we need to do is pop that in a calculator. So let's get out our calculator. And we've got 0 0.02 multiplied by 25 divided by 1000 equals 0, 0, 0, 0.005. So the number of moles of oxalic acid reacting is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.005 moles. So that is the amount of oxalic acid reacting. Okay, and we've run out of time because this is quite a long question. So we will do 7.4 tomorrow. Let me just see what I've got left. I've got some redox, some very nice redox, and then we're done. Okay, so tomorrow we will finish this question, 7.4, and do our two redox questions, and then we will move on to new work. Um, have a great evening. Cheers.